Welcome to my next video tutorial uh, for you, the members of my Gamma Optimizer room. This is uh, the next installment of the series about volatility and options. This tutorial will try to show finally what is the connection between volatility and options. We have spent some time talking about volatility, so in these lessons I am going to further elaborate about the connection between the two. And one way to elaborate between this connection is to solve the mystery of option pricing. So in this lesson, we are going to see how options are actually priced. Um, the subtitle, the title of the lesson is the mystery of option pricing and the subtitle is or why options are not real casino bets. So um, something that I want you to take away from this lesson is that option trades are, is, are not the same that betting in a casino. With that being said, I'll start with the casino example. We know that options are not casino bets yet. Let's start, let's start with casinos. The reason I want to start talking about a casino is because the casino solve an interesting problem. The casino solve the problem of pricing certain events that are uncertain. I mean, you never know when you do a coin toss, you don't know where it's going to fall. Or when you bet in a roulette, you don't know the number that is going to fall. And there are no mathematical formulas that can tell you in advance what is the next number in the roulette. However, the casinos know how to price these games and they know how to price these games in such a way that they will always make money. So the reason they know how to do it is because the theory to price on certain outcomes exists since hundreds of years ago. And uh, the theory is very simple. I mean, the, the, out, the fair price of any of any random outcome is just basically the expected value of the profit. And the expected value is just the statistical expected value equation. So if you know the expected value of anything, you can compute the fair price of, of any game. Um, for those of you that want to research more, I, I, I will recommend that you read an introductory book about the statistics and you can see the definitions of expected value. I'll, I'll try to cover it here in this lesson quickly, but it's, it's, it's nothing very complicated. No? It's just it requires you to know the probabilities and, and just how to add them together and it will give you an expected value. So I have two examples. I have the example of the coin toss and I have the example of the roulette. There are no coin tosses games in the casinos, but I, I include the example here because it's an example with very simplistic probabilities. So if you know the probabilities of the event, you can compute certain um, values. For instance, if you know that the probability of getting a heads in a coin is 0 0.5 and the probability of getting the tails is 0 0.5, then it's very easy to compute the expected value of profit, the expected value of, um, of let's say that if if I invent a price where I give you one dollar if you guess correctly in the coin toss, then the expected value of that one dollar is zero point five, so it's fifty cents. So what I means is that in a coin toss, the fair value of a bet is fifty cents if the reward is one dollar. So it gives you the concept of the even money bet. It's, it's a fair bet because it's only two possible outcomes, and it's paying you you know, 100% return on your investment, which is the is the the fair price. The reason there are no coin tosses in casinos is because casinos will never pay you fair price. Casinos will probably give you only 80 cents if you bet 50. So it will be too easy to see the edge of the casino in the game. Casinos prefer games where the edge is not so visible, so so visible, and they are not so easy to compute. For instance, in a roulette which is probably the most popular game in any casino. Uh, an American roulette has 38 possible numbers. It has 36 numbers and one zero and one double zero. So there are 38 symbols on the roulette. When you bet on any of them, the probabilities of getting any number right is one divided by 38. So what that means is that the fair payment, the fair price, is 38 times whatever you bet. That will be the like like the fair price. Is the price that is fair to compensate for any risk. But casinos don't pay that. Casinos only pay 35 times what you bet. 
So not is like uh, you know casinos know that there are going to be some winners, but they are only paying thirty five times the 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 bet, which is substantially less than the fair price. In fact, it's five percent less. So the edge of the casino on the roulette is five percent. The casino knows statistically that in a game like that is going to collect at least five percent of all the bets that are placed there. So I, I just introduced this quickly because I wanted to show you that even though you can have events that we cannot predict, we could price them and we could price a uh, fair cost for us if we want to bet on those outcomes. So this is uh, introduces the concept of a distribution. Here I'm going to introduce a game that is a little more elaborate and is also easier to understand, which is the just throwing dice. So we have two dice. The outcome of that two dice roll is randomly distributed, and here I have a table that shows you for every value. Of course, I, this is a disclaimer. I got this out of the internet. I don't have time to draw all these things, so <laughs> I just copy and paste, and I apologize to whoever had this original chart. I'm giving credit here, some kind of anonymous credit to it. But it's you know it's just so I didn't have to spend time creating the histogram and the chart. Uh, here is the the probabilities for every number, no? In a, because we have two dice with six numbers, the total possible combinations is 36, and you can see how to get the number two, only one combination of, of those provides the number two, and two combinations provide the number three, and three provide the number four, and so forth and so on. You can see that the most, the most probable number in a roll of two dice is the number seven. It has six divided by 36, so the probability is substantially higher than any other uh, number on the, uh, that you could get from the dice. But what I wanted to show you is that you can compute a table of probabilities, and also you can compute a histogram of those probabilities. And the shape of this histogram, even though this is a discrete distribution, kind of resembles a normal distribution. It kind of resembles a Gaussian distribution. More or less, but I, we, we are not into that right now. We just, I just wanted to show you that for any particular game, you can, do, you can compute a, a table of probabilities for every outcome. And if we have this really well understood and well defined probability distribution, we can price uh, any game that comes to our mind. So for instance, I'm going to use the two dice game to construct options on it. And so I'm going to propose to you a little simple game. I am going to sell you options on the dice roll. The casinos don't do this, but we could invent a casino that do this. So if I sell you the call option for the number four, the option will pay you the difference between the roll and the strike. You see, so if you buy options for the, the, with the strike of four and you get a 10, I'll pay you six bucks. That's it. And you know, it's a cash settle option, and it's the difference between the strike and the roll. If I got an option with a strike eight, and I roll a four, then I don't pay you anything, and that's it. I mean, if, if, the, if the roll is less than the strike, the option is out of the money and doesn't pay. This, is, this kind of sounds very similar to a call option, no? So let's do that. Let's price options on the roll of two dice. The, the question remains, becomes now, sorry, is, Okay, what is the price of the option? So I am charging you, you are buying an option for me for, with a strike of four, you have to pay me some money because I will pay you, if we roll the dice, I, I will pay you something. I mean, if you get a 12, I have to pay you eight bucks. So what is the fair price for that option? Notice, uh, notice that this is an interesting question and it's kind of similar, I guess, in your mind, you will think that this is a similar situation with, with equities. Now, I have these options, and by the time the options expire, I really don't know what the, what the strike, what the price will be, so I don't know how much money I will be, have to pay you as an option dealer. So let's see how options are priced in this pure probabilistic um, framework. So here is the game that I, described, that I just described. Uh, a call option with a strike of six, if it rolls nine, it pays three. If it rolls anything below six, it pays zero. So uh, remember, the fair price for an option is, uh, the fair price for any game is the expected value of the profit. So let's 
see the profit for this option. The profit is actually the roll minus the strike. That's the profit. So here I am computing the expected value for the profit. So if I roll a seven, this, the profit is one. If I roll an eight, the profit is two. If I roll a nine, the profit is three, so forth and so on. This P is the probability of rolling a seven, the probability of rolling an eight, the probability of rolling a nine. That's what the expected value is. The expected value is all of the possible values that the random variable can take times the probabilities. It's a sum. It's the addition of every possible value times its probability. So uh, you're making uh, one buck, and what is the probability you're making one buck? You're making two, what is the probability of making two? You're making six, what is the probability of making six? If you add up everything, it will be, give you 1.56. Where I get the probabilities? I get them from here. So I mean the probability of rolling uh, a 7 is 6 over 36. Now so 1, 6 and you, you basically use a calculator and convert this nice fraction into a D, like a nom normal number. And then you just add the whole thing up and you'll notice that the expected value of the profit in this game is 1.56. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is if I am an option dealer selling call options with a strike six for dice, then I should charge you at least 1.56. If I charge you 1.56 and we play this game until the end of times, none of us will actually make money on this. No, <laughs> that's how it works. This is a fair price. There is no advantage to anyone here. So of course, you know, no one sells a fair price. So if I'm selling you this option, I have two. If I, if I give you the option, um, for no, for the strike six of, of the two on the roll of the two dice, and I charge you two bucks, then I have an edge, and the edge is the difference between the two dollars and the fair price. So I have a forty-four cent edge per throw. So that means that in ten rolls, I am making four bucks. I will make four bucks. Of course, I am going to, in some rolls, I am going to have to pay you a lot of money. For instance, if you roll a twelve, I will have to pay you six bucks now, but because of the way the probabilities work in a large enough number of rolls, I am going to accumulate uh, 0 0.44 times every roll. This is how you make money. This is how the edge is done. And of course, you can tell that the price of the option for uh, this particular game only depends on the strike because you know the probabilities are always the same. So based on the strike, uh, you will have different expected values. For instance, the call option of 12 is only, uh, is cost zero because there is not, you will never make money on that call option. But let's do the call option at 11. So I don't know, call option at 11 will only pay money if you roll at 12 and it will only pay you one buck. So you, call, you come here to the table, you can see that the probability of rolling at 12 is 136. So this option is priced at 136. That's what it costs the option, which is nothing now because it will only pay you one buck and it's very unlikely that it will pay you. So that's the fair price. And an exercise is, what is the fair price, fair price for a call option with a strike of one? Why I do this exercise? This ex the, the, the reason to do this exercise is to see that if I do an call option with a strike of one, this option will always make money. I mean, I will always have to pay because any roll of the dice will always pay. So I want to show you, I want to show you that as an option dealer, I don't care if the option pays or not. There's something that most of you think that market makers and option dealers are losing sleep because the options are going to pay money. No, I don't care. I mean, so if I come up with a good fair price for a strike of one, I don't care what the outcome is because I am pricing my risk right away. So this is an exercise you can do. I can give you the answer if you want. The answer is six bucks. The fair price for an option, for a strike option of one in this game is six dollars. So if I'm charging you seven dollars for it, I am always paying you. You are rolling the dice. I am always paying you. We play this game. You consistently, you are so good at this. You think you are good and you are always buying the option for one <laughs> because you know, that's the sure bet. Like you will win 100% of the time. You're going to get some money back. But if I am charging you seven bucks 
I am making one dollar per throw because the fair price is six. So you throw this thing a hundred times and at the end of the day, I'll be making a hundred bucks. Even though there could be some, tra some cash transfers in between. Sometimes you can roll a 12, sometimes you can roll a 10. But you know, at the end of the day, I will, make it, I will be making money. So as an option dealer in this game, I don't care about the outcome. And that's something that is very important to you, all of you guys. Uh, even though options are not priced like these games, in general, the concept is the same. The concept is an option dealer doesn't care about the final price of the underlying because the price they charge for the option, it was either fair price or uh, just above fair price. And I just I have my edge with me and period, that's it. I have my edge, I don't care. So I know that most, some of you or most, I don't know, think that there are little games that are being played on Fridays, so options so to move the underlying in such a way that, for instance, call options don't pay that much money, or to move the underlying in such a way that put options don't pay that much money. That's a complete naive concept, and I want to disabuse you of it. As an option dealer, I could care less where the underlying finishes, as I just showed you here in this example. If, you, if I know my risk, if I, can, if I can quantify the risk, I can price the option in such a way that who cares? And the, the options for uh, this little game of dice show you that. And you know, as a side note, if anyone wants to start an online game like this, you can make lots of money exploiting the 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 fact that most people are mathematically challenged and a two dollar option for a strike of six is doesn't seem that expensive no even the seven dollar option for the strike of one doesn't seem that expensive so you will always find a public willing to spend the money on a losing proposition okay so i come i come to this concept of the casino edge so in a casino the prices for any games are always above fair price and the difference between this pricing is called the edge and is the source of wealth for all the casinos. And this is a co concept that is also present in options and in, in shares and in, in the financial market. That's what edge is. Edge is, is this, um, this source of wealth that is embedded in your trade setup. If your trade setup has a positive edge, you know that if you do it many times, you will, will always come out with a positive uh, profit. But the, here is the problem. The problem is all of the games in the casino, um, for instance, the game with the two dice uh, game that I just showed you, all of those games have well-defined probability distributions. Not only well-defined, but well-understood. We know the probability distribution for the two for the two dice game. We know the probability distributions for all of the, care, the, all of the cards in a um, game that uses uh, arbitrary number of decks. We know probability distributions for the roulette. We know probability distributions for every single thing in a casino. And because we know the probability distributions, we can price the games correctly to always make money of them. However, in real life, in the options market, in the financial markets, we don't have probability distributions for anything. I know that's the holy grail of every single one of us. Like if you can discover the true probability distribution of any underlying, then you can be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams. I mean, because then you can compute the correct prices for all of these instruments and you can quickly identify under prices uh, and overpricing and you can always come up on top and you can build your own edge and make lots of money. So the, the, the problem now becomes, so what happens when we don't know the probability distribution? Here was very simple. We know all of these probabilities for all of, first they, the outcomes were discrete. You ha only have these possible outcomes. And second, you knew the probabilities for all of the outcomes because we have the probability table for all of them. But with, with uh, shares or well, indexes or anything that trades in a market, we don't have those probabilities. We really don't know them. Yet, we managed to price them. So I'm going to show you, like there are many ways to price them, but let's see one way to price them. So this is 
we can price this with the binomial model. I'm going to talk about the binomial, binomial model, but more important than the binomial model is the only way to price options is when you remove away the risk factor that they contain. So as an option dealer, in the case of the dice throwing game, there is no way to remove the risk. I mean, because you don't know the outcome, there is no way to hedge against that risk. So I'm assuming full risk on the game. But in exchange of that, I know that the probability distribution, so I can protect myself with that knowledge and price correctly. But in the case of real options, I don't have that. But different than the game on the dice, with the real options, I have the option to protect me, to protect myself with shares. So I, can, I could always hedge my exposure to risk, and that's the beauty of the real world. So as an option dealer, I can always hedge risk away, at least theoretically. So in order to illustrate that hedging of risk, let's look at a hypothetical portfolio. And I'm going to call this portfolio the risk neutral portfolio. And what is my portfolio? My portfolio is consists of one call option. So I have one call option. And for each call option that I have, I, ch I have a short amount of shares. The letter S denotes the price of the shares. And I'm going to call that unknown amount of shares that I have to short like D. So D is this magical parameter that will hedge my call exposure magically so, you know, and it has to be a chart because if, you know, the call options go up in price, if the underlying goal go up in price and call options go down in price, if the underlying goes down in price. So the, the hedge is a chart, you no, know? that's the hedge for a call. And I want this to be the perfect hedge. <laughs> so perfect hedging. Is, is useless, but I, this is one of the cases where it's useful. In a perfect hedging, uh, the hedge is so perfect that the portfolio doesn't change value at all. So in a perfect hedging, if the options go up in price, my call goes up in price, but this short hedge, I lose more money. So at the end of the day, the gain on the calls balances with the loss on the shares. Therefore, the portfolio didn't change any price. And vice versa, if if the stock fell, the price of the call option also falls, but then I make money on my chart, which is enough to offset the, co the price on my call option. So this portfolio will never change value. That's the whole point of my portfolio. Uh, the, the, the chairs can do whatever, and my portfolio will have always have the same value. That's what is called a risk-neutral portfolio. No? So... Um, the mystery on this portfolio is, okay, what is the correct amount of shares that I need to chart to always make a risk neutral? That's the first question we have to solve. Uh, and there is a whole mathematical treatment for that, but you know, instead of going like the full-blown mathematical way, let's go for an example. Yeah, let's, let's illustrate this with a real example. So let's say that our stock it costs 100 bucks. Why 100 bucks? Because every single option books has 100 bucks. And also because it's too easy to compute these with 100 bucks. And let's imagine that the call option we are holding is the $100 strike. Why the $100 strike? Because it's the at the money option. So the at the money option is the easiest one to price. No, so, but the, the whole concept extends to any strikes. So I'm using the 100 strike because it's so easy to price. So this is the add the money option. So so we have a portfolio with one add the money call with a strike 100 and the shares are trading at 100. And look at this. The the thing is the options are going to expire any moment. So right now it's like 359 99 99 99. I mean the, the options will expire in a little bit and I want to compute the optimal hedge factor and by computing this, I also want to compute the price of the call. So let's do an exercise. Let's see what is the exercise of uh, 100 strike calls. And so look at this. This is the classical binomial chart. So the only thing we need to know is that, okay, this stock is at 100, and this thing is going to expire in any moment now. I mean, the, the market is going to close, and this thing is going to expire. And I have no idea 
what the stock price is going to do. The stock price can go up or it can go down. And I have no idea. Truly no one has any idea if the stock will go up and down. But look at this. If we have a little piece of information, we think the stock could go up one buck or could go down one buck in expiration. We know that. How? I don't know. But let's say that we know that. We know the magnitude of the move, but we don't know what is the direction of the move. So the stock could go up one or down one. So, and I don't have any idea about the probabilities. I have no idea. It could be really likely that it goes to like 99% certainty that it's going to go one and 1% 1 certainty that it's going to go down one. But it really doesn't matter because in stock up options, it's in options, the probabilities are not relevant. What is relevant is the magnitude of the move. So notice that. So it can go up $1 or could go down $1 at expiration, but we can price the portfolio. Imagine for a moment that it actually went one buck at expiration. What will be the value of my portfolio here? Remember, this is the perfect portfolio. So because the option that had a strike 100 finished in the money, what is the value of that option? Oh, that's very simple. Options are very simple to value at expiration. The value of an option and expiration is intrinsic value. So the intrinsic value for the 100 strike call option is one buck because this thing finished at 101, so the option is value at one dollar. But because the option is value at one dollar, what is the what is the value of my chart? Okay, so the shares are at 101, and I am short this. So the, my portfolio is 1 minus D times 101. I don't know what D is, but I know that that's the value of my chart. No? But this is the, the scenario if, they up, if the stock went up $1. Now, what happens if they, instead of going up, the stock went down $1? So what will be the value of my portfolio after expiration? The value of my portfolio will be, the option will be worthless, zero, you know, options that are out of the money, have zero intrinsic value, therefore they are cost zero. And what is the value of my chart? My chart is value like the number, mystery number of shares times 99, no? But so, okay, so how is that useful to know? Well, it's very useful because if I put the condition, if you remember, one of my condition is that this portfolio was perfectly hedged. So what it means perfectly hedged, that means that the value of the portfolio will never change. And so therefore, the value of the portfolio, if the stock goes to 101, should be the same value of the portfolio if the stock goes to 99. And so it's so easy, so I just, I just have to make P1 equals P2. And if I do that, these two equations the same, using like really basic algebra, I can really solve for d and the solution for this this equation d is called is 0 0.5 so i need to have 0 0.5 shares of this uh, of this particular stock you know just for a moment forget that little fact that there are no fractional shares but we know that we, we could scale it so it doesn't have to be fractional so the 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 hedging factor d is 0 0.5 and say, aha, uh -huh, we solve our hedging factor for the option, but we, all, we also are solving for the price of the option. You don't know it yet, but with D equals 0 0.5, it's so easy to know what the option is worth, because then we can come back. So now we know what our portfolio is. Our portfolio is one call options minus 0 0.5 shares. And knowing that, is incredibly powerful because that was the this is our portfolio that we had before the option expired now and because of that we know the value of c why because we know that the value of the portfolio has to be the same no matter what no that's what i mean that was a perfect hedge the value the portfolio will never change value so what I'm saying is that the value of the portfolio at this point before expiration has to be the same value at this point or the same value than at this point because it's a perfect hedged portfolio. So because of that, we, we know that this portfolio has to be equal to either P1 or P2. We can pick any of the two. I pick P2 because it's the one that is easy to solve. So, so making these two equations the same, I can write it like this, like the call option minus 0.5 
0.5 times 100 because that's what the stock was worth before expiration was 100 it has to be equals to minus 99 times 0 0.5 which is the stock at expiration and it gives me the price of the call option the call option should be 50 cents and it works with any equation you can use well the equation also for up this one and it will give you the same result because that's what we you know that was the whole goal of the exercise the whole goal of the exercise was to see what should be the correct price of the option so notice this is a very interesting way of pricing options now it's called the binary model uh, this is a very toy, this is a toy model this is not a real binary binomial model but it, it, i'm getting there no, so how do we value? Let's go over this. We imagine a perfectly hedged portfolio. We also imagine that the stock could go up or down a certain amount. I have no idea of the, about the probabilities. We don't need them, pro the probabilities at all. And we just s set to find the hedging factor. And also with that hedging factor solved, then we went to the original portfolio and we applied the constraint that the portfolio has to be the same at any of the two points on that particular binary node and it gives me that the call option should be priced at 0 0.5 and that's a very interesting finding notice that in the whole discussion of finding the price of this option the probabilities of the moves never entered into place so if I am if I am doing a completely risk neutral portfolio, I don't care about the probabilities of the moves. I only care about the magnitude of the moves. And knowing the magnitude of the moves allow me to know the price of the option. Of course, this is a very limited toy model, but it's very accurate toy model. I mean, this is the real toy model you could use any time before expiration. Why? Because this, this toy model, um, only requires the magnitude of the move and knowing the magnitude of the move is something that more or less uh, can be computed for any person before expiration but the problem with this this model is that, that this this model is only good just moments before expiration now uh, at a time but uh, what happened if i want to know the value of the call option months before expiration now this is just before expiration what, how much is the same call option like three months before three months before that that becomes the real exercise to here however i am going to stop the lesson here i'm going to give you time to process this particular toy model and i just want to like like summarize some insights about the model that we just created when we have this model, we created a portfolio that is free of risk, and this is also called a risk-neutral portfolio. Now, so when we talk about this risk-neutral world, now you know what we're talking about. It is risk-neutral because uh, because the portfolio, the value of the portfolio, doesn't depend on the price of the underlying. No, it doesn't, and changes on the underlying prices don't don't produce any changes in the portfolio. This is the second good effect of having a risk neutral portfolio is that the option prices don't depend on probabilities, which is very convenient because we don't know any probabilities. In this case, um, it's very different to the dice game that we created. In the dice game, we have probabilities here. We don't, and we don't need them because the fa by creating a risk neutral portfolio, we eliminate any need to know probabilities. And we replace that dependency on probabilities with something else. What is this something else? Uh, well, we replace it with the amount that the stock will move up or down. So the main factor right here uh, in the price of the option is actually the magnitude of that move up or down. If I know that magnitude, then I can compute an accurate uh, option price. So notice, notice how now option prices are depending on the magnitude of the move in an instant of time as opposed to the absolute value of the underlying and as if you remember you, you if this, this move up or down we could write it as a return you remember our class about returns then you could see the option prices depend only on the expectation of those returns no, this is the whole point of the thing. And you remember that the whole distribution of returns and standard deviation and whatever is the volatility. So this is a hint right, right here 
that option prices depend on volatility. Even though in my little toy model, volatility is not yet introduced, but you can see that there is a, it looks like volatility is the defining factor on the price of the option. So for the next lesson, now we are going to actually construct a real model that can value options at any time. It doesn't have to be one second before expiration or one moment before expiration, it could be months away. And also it's a model that could accommodate any move up or down. In this case, the move up was exactly the same, the, the move down went back. Uh, but when, once we develop that model, then you can see that the connection between option prices and volatility is right there. You will see it explicit. So this is it, my friends. I hope uh, you had fun with this class and I hope you didn't get confused by my model. Um, feel free to review that particular part several times. Uh, and the whole point was to drive away is that, that options are not real, real casino bets and that because the risk as an option dealer, I can hedge away my risk as opposed to in a casino. And so therefore I can price the option in such a way that risk is, is eliminated for me and I, I can't discover that price. And then I could, you know, sell it a little more expensive to, to get a little edge on that. So thanks again for staying with uh, me with the whole video and uh, stay tuned for the next lesson. Take care, guys.